I'm really delighted to be here. Uh, I am really happy to be part of the center. Uh, and I have learned so much about conservation, uh, coral bleaching, the, the futures. Uh, and what I'm going to try to do now is I'm going to tell you about my world. So I'm going to tell you about scales that are maybe up to a centimeter or a couple of centimeters. And I'm going to tell you about molecular mechanisms and how cells interact with each other. Uh, and I'm going to a bit tell you about uh, what might have happened 800 million years ago. Uh, so I'm going to try to all squeeze it in 15 minutes. All right, so I'll start with telling you who did the work. Uh, the work mainly comes from the experiments we have carried at the SARS Center back in Norway, where I was running my lab for seven years. Uh, the first author is uh, my most trusted collaborator and bioinformatician, and then the rest of the people are either members of my lab or collaborators, and Sasha Reskowski is at the CNRS, and he did most of the electron microscopy, or all of the electron microscopy work uh, that, I have, that I will be showing you now. All right, so most of you can relate to corals, and you know that corals can regenerate pretty well. And when I talk about regeneration, I don't mean regeneration of the reef. I mean about a physical insult to a particular coral. So when a parrotfish bites, when a diver kicks, when a cyclone comes through, corals become injured, but they can regenerate pretty well. So these are not my images, but I have found a couple of nice examples. So if you have a physical injury here or here, within approximately two months, you have perfectly nice regeneration where new polyps are formed, new coralites are formed, and everything looks almost as it was if it was before. Now, I was absolutely surprised to find out that people have no idea what is happening there. So there is quite a lot of studies where people looked at what is happening when you change water temperature, when you change the pH, uh, when you have uh, different kind of nutrient composition, but nobody actually has looked and published it in a way that I could find about the, what cells are involved uh, and what molecular mechanisms are being involved in regeneration of corals. Now, in contrast, people have been for, I would say, hundreds of years looking at regeneration of other cnidarians, especially Hydra, which is a freshwater, uh, a freshwater polyp, and Nematostella, which is a close relative to corals. It's a, uh, it's a sea anemone. So those, both of those animals look more or less like this drawing here. They have a mouth here, they have tentacles here, and they have two body layers, the endoderm and the ectoderm. And the mouth, as Dr. Carl told us, uh, uh, Yesterday is also their butt, so he said corals eat through their butt. I would say, well, this is actually quite a good approximation of what they do. So all the polyps have just one uh, body opening, and it's both the mouth and the anus at the same time. All right, so what do we know? Well, we know that if you cut, if you chop hydra into very small pieces, uh, you get very beautiful regeneration. So if you cut hydra that looks like this into three pieces, you'll get three little hydras. And what is quite exciting is that there is no cell proliferation necessary. So the cells can rearrange and build a new animal that is complete. complete. It has the new food, new mouth, and everything else without any cell proliferation. In contrast, in the matostella, if you poke it, the, the healing of the wound doesn't require any cell division, but if you need to form a new body, if you need to form, form the new mouth or tentacles, you need cell proliferation. Now, when it comes to molecular mechanisms, they tend to be also different. So in both of those animals, wind pathway, which is a signaling pathway heavily used in a lot of developmental mechanisms, uh, is involved in regeneration. It's, many components are immediately uh, upregulated, and I have painted it red, and I hope there are not many people who do not see red here. So the, the wind pathway components, and especially the wind uh, signaling molecules, are expressed around the mouth or the anus, which is the same thing. And there is also another group of signaling molecules that are expressed there, which are TGF-beta signaling molecules. Now, excitingly to me, and I'm going to tell you in a moment why, in a hydra, TGF-beta appears to be immediately very strongly upregulated, but in a nematostella, there is basically no change in TGF-beta ligands, transcription factors, and so on expression. What we also know is that you chop those animals, the axial polarity is preserved. So even if you look at this mid-body slice, the top knows that it's the top, the bottom knows that it's the bottom. All right. So those two 
Nidarians regenerate very well. They use different molecular mechanisms. Different cells are involved. Different, different genes are involved. So perhaps if we look back into the evolutionary history and we look into sponges, which are the first evolved animals uh, that we can look at now, uh, perhaps we can figure out which of those mechanisms are ancient. So sponges, which are my favorite animals, uh, come in very different shapes and colors, from tiny ones, less than one centimeter, to some that are bigger than me, like the giant barrel sponges. And they are pink, and they are gray, and so on. And some of you recognize this as Amphimedon queenslandica, which, is, which lives on the Great Barrier Reef, and we was the sp first sponge ever to be sequenced. All right, sponges regenerate pretty well too. So these are not my images. Uh, I got them from this very beautiful um, ecology paper. If you cut a piece out of a sponge, it's going to regenerate quicker than the coral, and it's just going to look perfectly the same uh, in basically two, two weeks or three weeks. Sponges have another uncanny ability. If you, uh, if you dissociate the cells, if you run them through a sieve, uh, and then you just leave them be, uh, they will, the cells will re-aggregate, and a new sponge can be rebuilt in some species. So basically, after two to three weeks, you can have a perfectly fine sponge that came from dissociated cells. It's almost magical, I would say. All right, so the system on which I was, uh, I was working when I was in Norway was this calcareous sponge, which is called Seconciliatum. It has two body layers, so the outer one here and the inner one here. The reproduction is, so it's a brooder, so it has uh, embryonic development inside. The larvae are beautiful, they are the dispersal element. And then there is settlement, and then there is metamorphosis. Uh, calcite spicules are being produced. And then a little asconoid juvenile is, is produced, which is pretty cool. It has the inner layer of coanocytes, which are the cells that produce the water movement. It has the outer layer, where is my arrow? of pinacocytes, and the water moves from the outside, gets in, and it's expelled here. So there is no mouth, there is just a big uh, opening on the top, which is called the osculum, which might be homologous to the mouth of the polyp. So we have done the genome sequencing, the transcriptome sequencing, and we spent quite a lot of time trying to understand how the body of sponges is similar to the body of cnidarians, and from that, how the body of cnidarians is similar to the body of us humans, for example. So I'm going to cut the long story short. I'm just going to tell you now that sponges and cnidarian polyps are actually not very different from each other. Uh, in both cases, wind and TGF beta expression is around the major opening, which is the exhalant canal in the sponges, and which is the mouth and the anus at the same time in cnidarian polyps. And we also, so this is... Uh, this is the expression you can see around the osculum here and around the osculum here and around the mouth here and around the mouth here. And we have basically started thinking about sponges and corals the same way that in the 19th century as Heckel was thinking about them, basically that, wind, uh, that the wind and TGF beta expression and the two body layers are supporting the view that sponges and nidarians are very much the same. But that's not the story I wanted to tell you now. What I wanted to tell you is that if you chop Sycon into pieces, like if you did some kind of salami slicing, you would get beautiful regeneration as well. So in one or two days, you see membrane that is closing the, the open atrium, and then in five or six days, you have skeletal elements being formed, and then you have a functional new perfect sponge uh, that maybe doesn't look exactly like the previous one, but it's working pretty well. And then, as much in Nidarians, the body polarity is preserved. So we send those samples, or samples fixed in a special way, to our collaborator in France, Sasha Reskowski, and Sasha demonstrated by those beautiful scanning electron microscopy images that what is happening is that two, there are two elements to the regeneration. The pinacocytes, remember those outer cells, they migrate, so you can see the leading edges, and they are migrating to close the exposed coanocytes, but where they cannot reach, coanocytes themselves, which are normally very cuboid cells, they have the collar, they have the flagellum, so they flatten out and they become pinacocytes. So basically what those cells are doing is they are changing their identity completely from coanocytes to pinacocytes, they are transdifferentiating, which is a pretty interesting biological phenomenon. We had a look at cell proliferation, and I'm afraid you can't see much because it's a bit too bright here, but I hope then that you will believe me that what is happening is that during the first 24 hours, there is basically no cell proliferation that is increased. The cell proliferation is 
visible in crystal proliferation, proliferation is visible only after approximately two or three days, and that the cell proliferation is not responsible for formation of this closing membrane, but it is somewhere else in the body where the coronocytes are proliferating. It's basically compensating for the movement of cells, but it's not producing new cells as such to close the membrane, to close the, the open body. All right. So we did an extremely complex experiment in which we decided to find the genes that are responsible for these regeneration processes. So what we did is we did a number of dissection experiments. We have kept the slices for a given number of days, and we tried to figure out which genes are upregulated during this process. So we have started by the pilot study where we first asked, is there any difference in the regeneration top and bottom at 24 hours? And is, there expression, is the expression along the body axis normally recovered within a week when we see the normal, uh, normal body plan? And we found that, yes, this is all the case. So there is, we couldn't find any difference in the early stages between the regenerative top and bottom, and we found that we get the perfect recovery of the axial patterning genes uh, along the body axis. And then we did another series of experiments where we tried to ask what is happening in those very early stages of regeneration, so during the wound healing, so especially we wanted to know what is happening even before, what is happening on the gene expression level, even before we see any cell uh, changes, before the cells start to transdifferentiate and before the cells start to move. So we looked at 3, 6, 12, and 24 hours. And then we also looked at the axial polarity. So we asked when is the bottom start to be very different from the top. And I'm not going to tell you about all those results. I'm going to focus on the wound healing. And of course, to our delight and, uh, and slight feeling of being overwhelmed, we have identified over a thousand of genes that were dramatically upregulated during those different moments of, uh, of regeneration. And I should tell you that approximately 40% of those genes are unknown. We don't know what they are. They do not have any homologs outside of calcareous sponges. But we did a lot of looking as the any developmental biologist would do, we started looking to see what kind of genes we are finding there. And to our delight, or to my delight, because it was me actually digging in these data sets, was that I found that a number of both wind and TGF beta components, but also a number of very cool developmental transcription factors are upregulated, and they are upregulated from those very early stages and then up to those later stages. So that was telling us that both wind and TGF beta pathways are involved, and also what we were very excited to find is that not only wind and TGF beta pathway components, but also quite a large number of genes that are expressed around the osculum, which as I said are, is what we believe homologous to the Nidarian mouth, uh, that there is a number of genes that are expressed around the osculum, and then they are upregulated when the regeneration is happening. And this is very similar to what is happening in Hydra. So we see quite a strong similarity. So I'm going to very briefly show you a couple of, in situ, of additional in situ images. So for example, we looked at one of our favorite genes, which is TGF beta U. It's a signaling molecule. In an intact specimen, it's expressed only around the osculum, but then as the regeneration is happening, it is expressed in all those pinacocytes that become activated and move on to, uh, to, close the, to close the opening. And then the transcription factor from the same pathway is expressed in a more broad way. So as you could see here, it's TGF beta U is only expressed in those unique cells that are moving. SMATR is expressed in a broad area everywhere that is responding to the TGF beta U expression. So this is pretty cool. So we have found that Cycon and Hydra share a number of regeneration mechanisms. So they appear to be the same genes or the same classes of genes that are involved. There seem to be similar uh, mechanisms, meaning the cells can move and they can transdifferentiate and they can rearrange rather than relying only on cell proliferation. But of course, we are trying not to be naive about it. And we also know that there are big differences between Hydra and Nematostella, which of course are closer related than Hydra and Cycon. So that means that all those changes that we have found that are similar, they might be convergence or, conserva or conservation of mechanisms, so we need to find that out. We have also found those hundreds or almost a thousand of unknown genes, and we are pretty cool on understanding what these genes are doing. We also know from other experiments run in the lab that those genes are up, some of those genes are upregulated simply when you dissociate the cells, and they might be forming some new signaling pathways that are known only in calcareous sponges. And finally, I want to get 
back to the question I have, I have started in the beginning. So we know there are differences between different Nidarian regeneration mechanisms, and we don't know which genes are involved in regeneration of corals, which cells are involved, is it relying on cell proliferation, and so on. So I've been very happy to be talking to Tracy and Bill, who have started looking at regeneration in one of the Acropora species, and we are hoping to start... I shouldn't stop talking. Uh, and we are really looking forward to... Uh, to start looking at molecular and cellular mechanisms of regeneration in corals. And if that, I also wanted to introduce uh, our new model species. So since we moved from Norway, we have been looking for the past uh, year and or almost two years for a psychonovid calcareous sponge that would replace the conciliatum. And this is our new model. It's called Sicon Capricorn. And it is known from Heron Island, but we also find it in Jervis Bay. And and here is a whole number of people who have contributed in a variety of ways uh, to this project. Thank you very much.